Tantaha Sameva Shinam Rishabha Prasidatam A very what, musical, you know, uh, uh, beautiful, st- beautifully structured, full of resonances and, and echoes, you know, the Sanskrit, the prayers. Okay, translation. May the Lord, who in the beginning of creation amplified the potent knowledge of Brahma from within his heart and inspired him with full knowledge of creation and of his own self and who appeared to be generated from the mouth of Brahma, be pleased with me. Please repeat. May the Lord. May the Lord. Who in the beginning of creation, in the beginning of creation, amplified the potent knowledge of Brahma, amplify the potent knowledge of Brahma from within his heart, from within his heart, and inspired him, and inspired him with full knowledge of creation, full knowledge of creation, and of his own self. And who appeared to be generated and who appeared to be generated from the mouth of Brahma. The mouth of Brahma. Be pleased with me. Be pleased with me. Okay, so Maharaj. Uh, oops. Uh oh. I gotta move something here. Sorry. I don't have enough real estate to turn you on. <laughs> Forgive me. I have to expand until I get to the mute buttons. Okay, so technical difficulty here. Oh, right. Now only you can be heard. <laughs> There's some kind of significance about that. Well, anyway, we find a nice picture on the Internet here of the Lord Brahma. And one thing right away is that he uh, he has a such an on the body it describes in the in the um, uh, nectar of devotion, so some of the pictures of Brahma, many times they, they pose him as an old guy with a beard, you know, like this and that, you know. But uh, here is more likely what he was, what he is, eternally youthful. Really, I, mean, I could see it would be very easy if you met him to, to think he was God, you know, full of youthful energy and vitality, and you know, seeing things in so many different angles. You know? So if that, that's Brahma, my goodness, you know. What is Krishna? Yeah. So this is the the translation, and uh, it is this whole section of, uh, of verses. You know, of course, now in the second canto, uh, Maharaj Pariksit is, is talking to Sukadeva Goswami for the first time, and he asks him, "What is the duty of a man during his life in the time of death? His dharma?" And Maharaj, the Sukadeva Goswami answers in uh, chapters one, two, three. His first answer is, we should always hear and, and, and chant about the Lord's glorious uh, manifestations in the external world. Because in the, in the mode of goodness like that, we can see such beautiful uh, alive life you know, being manifested. The mode of passion becomes distorted, and the mode of ignorance it becomes completely reversed, you know, perverted. Uh, perverted, uh, sort of reverse of what, what the spiritual world is. You know? So... Uh, he's suggesting, always hearing and chanting about these glorious you know, manifestations of I'm the taste of water, I'm the light of the sun and the moon among mountains, I'm immovable objects, I'm the Himalayas. You know? And then uh, the second chapter he talks about how that same progression, same meditation can progress to the, the Paramatma. This is, you see total parallel with Bhagavad Gita uh, 10 and, and uh, <coughs> 10, 10 and 11. 10 and 11? Yeah. Because then it goes to Virat Rup Darshan, which is the which is the Paramatma who's everywhere, who maintains everything, you know? and so then he t- t- describes meditating on that aspect of the Lord, who who we can see everywhere. You know? Somebody less intelligent, he can't see the cause behind everything. You know? The more intelligence, you you can see. Oh, this is happening because of this, that, this, that, this, that. You know? yeah. And then thirdly, finally, the third chapter in the second canto. It's called the, uh, the pure, pure devotional service, the changing heart. But really, as far as my readings go, it's only the very last verse which really talks about the actual changing heart and so on. But it comes to that. You know? and there's something else beyond appreciating God in nature, 
I got beyond appreciating God with our heart, and finally appreciating God as as the uh, supreme, you know, worshipable uh, everywhere you know, as a person. Yeah. And so then in Mr. Then Mark Frick says, "Please tell me more. Tell me more. Uh, you said everything, but let's go through it again." You know? So what Sukadeva Swami will do is actually present the same Shrimad Bhagavatam as, as Brahma presented it to Narada. But before he starts, he has all these very, very beautiful prayers, you know, just uh, fixing our consciousness properly. In Chaitanya Charitamrita, <coughs> Krishna Das Kaviraz mentions the names of different great, great personalities at the start of the chapter. And he mentions, I think, even certain deities, you know, different manifestations of Krishna and Vrindavan. And he says, simply by saying their names and remembering them, it invokes auspiciousness. It puts things in perspective, it puts things in harmony, and everything else like that. You know? Like if, for example, we hear that, okay, oh, to Omar, did you hear? Barack Obama wants to listen to the class today. <laughs> so, the whole, you know, the whole perspective on the class changes like that. You know, you can imagine yourselves, one of yourselves, you know, if suddenly you knew that Barack Obama would listen to your class, Bhagavatam class, I, your mind would just start like you're trying to catch this, trying to do that, think of this possibility, think of that possibility. And it, it gets a whole new perspective on things. You know? yeah. And so, um, this Lord Brahma is just such an incredible person. You know? But before this, uh, the, the prayers is very nice. Look at the prayers, one nice project, because we'll see. We'll go ahead here, I think I have a little bit of help on this. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah. So basically, this whole whole verse uh, comes down to, "May the Lord be pleased with me." That's the, the whole. This whole verse we're discussing right now is, "May the Lord be pleased with me." Yeah. And there are many verses. The first first collection of verses in these prayers is, uh, "Let me offer my respects to Namo Namaha, Namo Namaha, Namo Namaha." Okay. And there's no asking for benediction or anything else. It's just um, maybe I, may I be permitted to glorify, kind of like you know Shantaras. God is great. God is great. You know? But now he's actually maybe moving to the next thing, which is more like Dasiras, um, you know, wanting, wanting you know to to be to be taken care of, you know, by the Lord, be a servant. You know? But as he's going on. May the, may the Lord who, this word who comes in here, you see that there, who, okay. Well, what, what kind of Lord? May the Lord be pleased with me, but which Lord? So then he starts talking about in all these verses, all the different qualities of the Lord. The Lord, the Lord who is bigger, the Lord who is richer, the Lord who is faster, the Lord who is, who, who is this, the Lord who is that. You know? The Lord who is the master of Gokula, the Lord who is the son of Maharaj Nanda. Well, those things aren't there, you know. So it's a very, very nice um, project for somebody to go through and just put, put into a nice list all of the different qualifications. And we see here in this one, there's about one, two, three, maybe three, three major uh, you know, qualifications of four or five that are being listed, and this is one verse. So in, what is it, maybe like about 10 verses or something, or 12, make up this series of, of prayers, maybe more. And so maybe 50 different qualities of Krishna are being mentioned. It's a very nice project is just to put them in like a simple order, English, uh, you know, and, and nice English, and even then maybe the corresponding Sanskrit that matches up with it. So just to look at this one, it says here, May the Lord who, and which Lord? Well, it's just the Lord, the Lord who existed in the beginning of creation. May the Lord who, in the beginning of the creation, Okay, this is which Lord we're talking about. The Lord who, who, in the beginning of creation, one, amplified the potent knowledge of Brahma from within his heart. Okay, so one theory of education is uh, sit, sit still while I instill. And it's kind of like what we're doing now, you know. You mute while I talk. You know? Sit still, sit still while I instill. Or the empty box theory. You know? and, but Socrates' idea was something else. His idea was that by asking questions, the dialectic method, that people would use their intelligence then to discover what they already knew. 
And he had many examples of why why this had to be there. We had to come into this world with knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. So here it says he ampl amplified the potent knowledge of Brahma, yeah, from within his heart. Yeah. So yeah, of course it reminds us of Bhagavad Gita ten uh ten ten. Tesham Satata Yuktanam Bhajatam Patipurvakam Dadami Buddhi Yogam Tam. I give them intelligence. I give them intelligence. Those people who are, are constantly fixed devotees. And the next verse says how the intelligence is given. Tesham Evanu Kampartam Ahama Jnana Jam Tamaha Nasyami Atma Bhavasto Jnana Deepena Bhaspata. So what's in the heart? He, he illuminates with people like that. So a little bit of a question is did Brahma already know everything and the Lord simply made it made him aware of his knowledge but the next one seems to say um, it says inspired him with full knowledge of creation. So it sounds like maybe actually the word not, uh, knowledge here amplified the potent knowledge of Brahma doesn't exactly mean knowledge but actually means more like uh, knowing ability. Let's go back here. Okay. Yeah. Prachodaya inspired by whom in the beginning of creation amplified a Brahman's potent pretty. Swa Lakshana. Uh, and Lakshana using these qualities. So I don't see right away. Yeah. Pretty. Yeah. So Lakshana using these like qualities. How do Prabhupada say it here? Lakshana, aiming at Lakshana. Yeah. Okay, so these are very nice things to why it's nice to understand the Sanskrit, understand the Sanskrit, and of course, you know we're developing these educational programs now in ISKCON very practically, very systematically, um, for learning Sanskrit, conversational Sanskrit. You know, but then you start getting into these technical, uh, philosophical, religious, you know, uh, devotional Sanskrit. It starts to become even more rich and subtle and broad, like that. You know? And so, what to speak of being able to read something simple, or be able to read the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, and the Shrimad Bhagavatam is is a challenge for very, very great, great, you know, <coughs> pundits in Sanskrit, you know, the depth, the profundity, and everything else like that. But the more we get some of it, the more it purifies us, and the more we become potent instruments. You know, for Krishna. <coughs> Excuse me. So, in the beginning of the creation, this Lord we're talking about, one, amplified the potent knowledge of Brahma you know, from within his heart. Okay? And two, inspired him with full knowledge of two things. Creation and of his own self. So he gave Brahma knowledge of how to create the material world you know, after... The, the first, there are ten, ele ten elements in Srimad Bhagavatam. And the first one, of course, is uh, Sarga, creation by Mahavishnu. And Visharga is then creation by Brahma. And then uh, the third one is something else, I forget what it's called, but it's, but it's the third creation by the Manus. The Manus create, like that. Sarga, Visarga, and, and not, not potion of something else, I think. Manukata. Yeah. But it's called the creation of the third order also. Yeah. So then uh, he, he, he becomes amplified, or his knowing ability, or, or also some inherent knowledge. Yeah, and then he becomes inspired. Of course, spire means like respiration. Spirit means breath. Yeah. So he, he becomes inspired. The prana, the prana in his heart becomes agitated yeah, and with knowledge of how to create and also knowledge of Krishna's own nature, like that. Yeah, so the beginning of creation, this is the Lord we're talking about. Yeah. Three, and appeared to be generated from the mouth of Brahma. So see the prophet actually in the purport systematically deals with these things. Yeah. So of course there are many prayers here and it's, it's just like, you know, for example, putting a, uh, taking a piece of paper and then making a square border on it. You know, and then this, and making a cloud-shaped uh, thing, you know, with some curled edges within that, touching the boundaries, and within that making a kind of a wavy horizontal line, and on that making a little house, and that making windows, and in one of the windows, <laughs> yeah. 
so it's a holographic approach, not a linear approach. That's the word uh, 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 iconographic. That we don't really move forward in giving up something to get something better, but we take whatever we have and we just like putting it into relationship, into perspective, all these kind of things like that. Yeah. So this is just one prayer out of all the prayers, just one illumination, orientation on Krishna. And Sukadeva Goswami feels it is necessary for himself, uh, for Maharaj Parikshit, and probably for for the audience, and maybe for people in the future, you know, who are, who are going to be qualified to study Sri Bhagavatam. So we're, we're we're asking for the Lord to be pleased with us. Oh, what a nice position to be in, <laughs> if Krishna was pleased with us. Yeah, and well, not Krishna exactly, but uh, but who is this? This is. Uh, it's not even Maha Vishnu, exactly. This is this is Garbhadakshya Vishnu, huh? We got it. We got it pegged here. May May Lord May Garbhadakshya Vishnu, in the beginning of creation, amplify the potent knowledge of Brahma within his heart, and inspire him with full knowledge of creation and his own self, and appear to be generated from the mouth of Brahma. Be pleased with me. So maybe especially this point appear to be generated from the mouth of Brahma may be important, because many other Vedas, like we're saying. Purusha, Shukta, or things like that. People may think that Brahma is a creator. They do. Some people think, well, Brahma created all these prayers. Brahma is a supreme you know, deity, and so on like that. And he's a creator. Vishnu can only maintain what Brahma has created. So the great, great creator source of everything is Brahma. Okay. In the purport, Prabhupada says, as we have already discussed here, here and before, the Lord as the super soul of all living beings from Brahma to the insignificant ant endows all with the required knowledge potent in every living being. Okay? Yeah. Endows all with the required knowledge yeah. potent in every living being. So if you're endowing it, then how can it be potent in, in, in every living being? It sounds like you want to amplify it or and motivated like that. The basic principles there. That Krishna is the uh, the person, uh, Paramatma, the super soul, is uh, in giving all his inspiration to the, the, the ant up to Brahma. A living being is sufficiently potent to possess knowledge from the Lord in the proportion of 50 sixty fourths, or 78% of the full knowledge acquirable. Since the living being is constitutionally part and parcel of the Lord, he is unable to assimilate all the knowledge that the Lord possesses himself. So it's kind of a little bit sophisticated point. Because um, I remember when I first became a devotee, I got nectar of devotion, and it says that the living entity can have 70, 78% of the qualities of the Lord. And I couldn't quite understand that, because you know, God's unlimited, we're insignificant, so how can we be 78% as potent as God? But then going on, I understood, oh, it's, it's talking about, you know, the, not the, the, uh, the quantity, but the, the qualities. So Nectar of Devotion, it talks about 64 qualities of Krishna. And 50 of those, the living entity can also possess. Expert in many languages, uh, expert judge of time and space, intelligent genius, you know, funny, something. Yeah, okay. And then there's, what is it? Then there's like... Um, Again, uh, five, five more, ten more that, that Shiva and Brahma can possess, and a few more only Mahavishnu can possess, create universes. And finally, what is there? Six qualities, four qualities that Krishna alone possesses. Very wonderful associates, uh, very wonderful childhood pastimes, um, very, very beautiful bodily features, and a very, very excellent flute player. So that must be, I guess, four, four qualities like that. So, uh, um, Fifty sixty fourths, you know, is seventy eight percent. So the living entity can have seventy eight percent of the qualities, but Krishna has all of them unlimitedly. Yeah. And we have a little piece of a puzzle here. So this is a very idea. This whole idea of a part and parcel is very nice. I'm not sure where it comes from. Prabhupada uses it so much, but I have a real suspicion, of course, that it comes from Bhakti Nautak or Bhakti Siddhanta somewhere. And may even have like it was Anksa, you know, uh, Vibhinanksa, 
you know, I guess do Anksa like that. And then there's a little discussion in Chaitanya Charitamrita, of course, comparing Anksa to Anga, you know, and things like that. You know, saying that I think saying that Anga is more intimate, like a limb, than an Anksa. You know, you know. And so, um, it's just like so that ni- nice examples of the part and partial. Because it's because these philosophical points are dealt with all over the place. We're talking about the same thing. And different people have different level, levels and different nature of comprehension of reality. So, for example, one book I've seen a long time ago, from, I don't know, before, maybe even before, maybe in high school, maybe, but before uh, college, it was talking about this concept, and it says, for example, the idea, this was in college, yeah, the idea of the middle of the rope, you know. So everybody knows what the middle of the rope is. Two people stretch the rope out, and you say, hang, hang this banner over the, over the middle of the rope, fold it if you have to. Okay, so the idea is, you know, is it should fit within a certain area like that. You know, fold it if you have to, so it doesn't cover the edges. We're, we're going to put some more things there. So then everybody has some rough idea. What is the middle of the rope? You know, the middle two inches, the middle twenty-four inches, the middle something like that. But you can't, you can't say like, well, cut cut the middle of the rope out and bring it here. You know, so it, it's no longer the middle of the rope. You know, and so so it's a part of the rope. That's it. It's, it's a part of the rope. We are a part of Krishna, a part. Yeah. But at the same time, too, we're a parcel. Yeah. Another example of this is the corner of the room. Yeah. Okay, everybody knows what the corner of the room is. You know. Put put the uh, the co- display column and the flower vase in, in, in the corner of the room. Yeah. So 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 how big is the corner of the room? You know, you, obviously you're going to have a little bit of space around it between the wall and, and the column and the, the vase and the flowers. And then the flowers shouldn't touch the wall. There should actually be a certain amount of space in between them for to create, you know, their individual identity. You know. But being in the corner of the room, it also has a certain focus to them. You know. So very, very nice concept, the chinta bere bere tatva. Chinta, it's very inconceivable unless you're doing it, unless you're you know, have some act, active relationship with these things, unless you know the relationship between the part and the whole, you know, the parcel and the whole. Okay, living being is uh, since a living being is constitutionally part of and parcel of the Lord, he is unable to assimilate all the knowledge that the Lord possesses himself. In the conditioned state, the living being is subject to forget everything after a change of body known as death. Okay, yeah. This is very interesting, no? We we forget. Um but if you go to the, the good old universal information source, the the YouTube, uh, reincarnation, of course, there's a lot of very interesting uh, uh, videos, you know, some quite scholarly, you know. And as far as I can understand now, uh, it's accepted in the scientific community in America to, to investigate reincarnation with, you know, the warning of something like, well, be careful, doctor, you know. Like do it, but yeah, which is kind of like treading on dangerous ground where you can become considered a quack and lose your license and things like that. We're starting with people like Brian Weiss, W-E-I-S-S. He's a past life guy and a very big, you know, uh, psychiatrist. So people like that, when they started becoming convinced and stuff, it became like accepted to do it, to investigate it, you know, and that kind of thing. And so many now very serious results, you know, that you actually look at it and discuss it logically. It really makes us makes sense to accept that, you know, the uh, you know the smart money is is going on reincarnation. And then you, somebody to forget. Well, you look at then again another new thing is look look at uh, child child prodigy, you know, mu- music prodigy, and you see these kids unbelievable. You know, probably dance and there's also dance. Ability to play music. Well, one little guy, I forget his name. Uh, he was he was play, playing whole symphony. He was playing with a full symphony orchestra. You know, uh, at like something. He was still still like you know learning how to. It was a potty being potty trained. Like <laughs> he still have trouble controlling his you know his uh, lower functions there. Stuff. So he had to wear diapers. But already was was like memorizing or remembering. You know. And so one very very famous musician, this whole band and everything else. Took him as his protege and protected him from too much, uh, I call it, 
publicity and, and, and stimulated him, you know, stimulated him. And the most natural model is that somebody was a musician in their last lifetime, you know. And so usually, as I understand, until about three years old, we're floating around in these previous lifetime memories. We take them with us, you know. When the fire comes, you grab what you can and get out of the house and take some stuff with you, you know. <clears throat> but about three years old, the current intelligence and stuff begins to form so strongly that it really has a tendency to, to cover these, you know, previous things, you know. And so if in some cultures to stimulate this mem remembrance, like Tibetan culture or other cultures, then you're ready for this and you can hang on to your abilities, you can integrate them with what your, your new body and life are, are dictating, you know. And so then there's a real, real quite conscious, you know, awareness of, of previous lives and, 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 and things you're trying to accomplish and motivations, and you can deal with them in a very conscious fashion rather than trying to have to deal with them in the dark. So... In the conditioned state, the living being is subject to forget everything after a change known as body, known as death. <coughs> this potent knowledge is again inspired. Huh? Potent knowledge. Yeah. No knowledge that can create something is again inspired by the Lord from, from within the heart of every living being. So Papa says, the Christian reminds us of what we were trying to do in our last lifetime and why we're here. And it is known as the awakening of knowledge, for it is comparable to awakening from sleep or unconsciousness. Hmm. So potent knowledge. And here it sounds like higher philosophical at, at aptitudes. You know? yeah. So at some point we wake up, you know, awakening from sleep, you know, become aware of what we're doing. This awakening of knowledge is under the full control of the Lord. And therefore, we find in the practical world different grades of knowledge in different persons. This awakening of knowledge is neither an automatic nor a material interaction. Well, that's a very heavy thing, no? Because, of course, this big area is just developmental psychology, you know, uh, developmental, developmental, developmental physiology. And pretty much it seems that it all is you know, happening because of this natural reaction of different elements. Yeah. But um, cloning, okay, cloning we can produce a something at some level, a fertilized cell uh, or something, you know, which is pretty ki already kind of developed. And so we might compare this to somebody going in and is making a copy of a blueprint. And it has a very, very nice blue for blue blueprint for a house. So somebody goes and takes a copy which is laying on the, on the desk for the construction people, and he goes over to another uh, construction site and spreads it out. Okay, you know. So that can be done. You know? And so then we, see we can clone like uh, fruit flies, we can clone sheep. And so I was hearing one scientific guy talking about it, and he was saying, well, it's very easy to clone these lower, lower species and bacteria and stuff, you know. He said, but the higher species, they develop for some time, then they deform and they die. And sometimes you can go on and make a full, you know, full uh, baby or something, you know, mammal, higher species. So that, again, explained, Vedic culture would explain that very nicely, saying that, okay, we have a blueprint, you know, we're starting to call the uh, people to level the ground and people to, to uh, put the foundation in and, and the electricians to come and do their work and then, you know, the carpenters and so forth and so on. But unless there's going to be some inhabitant who's going to pay for the house and everything else with his, his, his credit, then after some time this, this stops and that stops and the weeds start to grow and the water starts to come and people start to do something else and the whole thing is just destroyed. You know? So if you've got mosquito bodies, you've got a lot of people with sufficient pious credits to move in. You know? But if you're talking about a mammal body, oh my God, that takes really a lot of pious credits to move in. You know? yeah. And so you know, we, we move into the body, there has to be a soul present for the body to develop. It's not act, not, what's the word like uh, Pablo says here, uh, not, not an, neither an automatic nor a material interaction. Like that. So the soul's presence has to be there. And then also the super soul who is manipulating the karma and everything else has to have an active process in the whole thing. So, 
even the clock model that God creates the whole world like a clock and then steps back and the whole thing runs beautifully so there must be a watchmaker e even that people criticize Newton with his ideas of inertia for introducing a uh, kind of an atheistic model his he wrote so much more on theology than he ever wrote on um, physical nature and for him physical nature was also theology studying God you know so, so those were written in, uh, I think, Latin, and now, I think, now they're being translated. Finally, there's some interest. They've been kind of stored for hundreds of years, you know. And some of the few concepts I've heard of, he was quite uh, compatible with ideas that we had, even even though they weren't weren't popular at his time, you know. Yeah. So interesting what he what he wrote on theology, his development of consciousness. But this, there has to be something present, you know. Not just as the soul has to be present. I think Papa saying the material nature of the elements will interact a little bit because there's a super soul in the universe. The individual elements have a little potency to interact. But then the, the individual soul has to be there with his desires and the Paramatma has to be there within, you know, stimulating everything and making it go on like that. So we see so much impersonal, um, uh, what's the word, similarity. All the dogs look the same way. All the cats look the same way. All the, you know, the amoebas look the same way. So, so it seems that the super soul is keeping a certain kind of uh, formality in his relationship with the material world, which is more like what the super soul is. You know? yeah. Okay, this awakening of knowledge is neither automatic nor a material interaction. The supply source is the Lord Himself. Dhyampati, Dhyampati. For even Brahma is also subject to this regulation of the Supreme Lord, this awakening of knowledge. So here we have flowers, birds, frogs, you know, chimpanzees, and, uh, and monks, <laughs> all with the awakening of knowledge. Yeah. In the beginning of the creation, Brahma is born first without any father and mother, because before Brahma, there were no other living beings. Brahma is born from the lotus, which grows from the abdomen of the Garbhadaka Shai Vishnu, and therefore he is known as Aja. So remember we had this word like that. This Brahma or Aja is also a living being, part and parcel of the Lord, but being the most pious devotee of the Lord, Brahma is inspired by the Lord uh, to create. Subsequent to the main creation by the Lord through the agency of material nature. Therefore, neither the material nature nor the Brahma is independent of the Lord. And here we have a picture of a duck getting bread. You can't get it independently. The material scientists can merely observe the reactions of the material nature without understanding the direction behind such activities. As a child can see the action of electricity without any knowledge of the powerhouse engineer. This imperfect knowledge of the material scientist yeah. is due to a poor fund of knowledge. Imperfect knowledge due to a poor fund of knowledge. Yeah. So again, people, you see a house, you see houses, you know. Yeah. And so we, we, we become more intelligent to understand in the whole process of, of construction. Yeah. Or you see an automobile moving. You understand more the process. It requires fuel, this and that. You know. So the phenomena is what we experience and the noumena is that which is behind the phenomena. Yeah. So material scientists probably says, again, they're not intelligent, you know. Then a child may develop more some intelligence. Okay, he knows, now he knows where breakfast cereal comes from. It doesn't just come from the, the cabinet in the kitchen or the box, you know. It comes from the grocery market, okay. Yes, where does, where does milk come from? They asked a lot of children this, and they all said the store. You know, they, they didn't know it came from cows. I forgot what age it was. It was actually quite a shocking age. Children still didn't know that milk came from cows. Yeah. 
So then it goes to the cows. You know? And then, okay, where do cows get it from? Okay, from grass, water, sunlight, oxygen. A few elements, you know, you can make a thing like that. And then so, so where does all the energy come from? Well, the sun, maybe some gravity too. You know? So if we, if we our, our, our seeing is filled with intelligence, you know, we see things as if, you know, we see things with intelligence. And of course it's exchanging, expanding. If you try and like develop a Sherlock Holmes intelligence, you know, then you try and look at things and see what they logically, uh, de what you can deduce, you know, logically from just looking at different things like that. It's amazing if you actually look with intelligence, you begin to see, you know, people's where they came from, how they're living, what wealth they have, you know, like that. You know? So. Material scientists can really observe the reactions of material nature without understanding the direction behind such activities, as a child can see the action of electricity without any knowledge of the powerhouse engineer. This imperfect knowledge of the material scientist is due to a poor fund of knowledge. The Vedic knowledge was therefore first impregnated within Brahma, and it appears that Brahma distributed the Vedic knowledge. Brahma is undoubtedly a speaker of the Vedic knowledge, but actually he was inspired by the Lord mm -hmm. to receive such transcendental knowledge as it directly descends from the Lord. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Vedas are therefore called Aparusheya, but not imparted by any created being. It's a very, very nice uh, website. It's called Spoken Sanskrit, and it's run by some German source. And you can just type these words in there, put them in there, and it may ask you like a little bit more detailed spelling or something. But it gives you very nice definitions of words, and it's, it's very interesting. I think this word of Parashe has like uh, only three. Usually there's many, you know. And it says exactly the same thing, divine origin, like this and that. You know? The Vedas are therefore called Aparusheya, or not imparted by any created being. Before the creation of the Lord, before the creation, the Lord was there. Narayana Parobyaktat. Narayana. 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 And therefore the words spoken by the Lord are, are vibrations of transcendental sound. Because there's no material creation, so this sound, uh, the words spoken by the Lord, existed before, therefore they are transcendental vibrations. And and even though Brahma appears to be the creator of these things, he himself is inspired by this by the subtle source. There is a gulf of difference between the two qualities of sound, namely Prakrit and Aprakrit. The physicist can deal only with the uh, with the Prakrit sound when the sound vibrated in the material sky. And therefore we must know that the Vedic sounds uh, recorded in symbolic expressions cannot be understood by anyone within the universe. Yeah. So Papa is making this coin. Cor you see we down below we have a little, you know, a, a leaf, leaf cutting or something with the original Vedic sounds, you know, written down there, like that. Yeah. So it, this Papa says that these are symbolic expressions. But what do they mean? What is the real pronunciation even, you know? Because you can pronounce something very, you see, very externally, or you can pronounce this sort of stimulating, more subtle aspects of your consciousness, your rhythm, your timing, you know, overtones. You, know? you can say something just without understanding even what it means. Something in Spanish. You know? I can say things in Spanish and people teach people to say them, but they won't know what it means. You know? And then, of course, if you know it within the context, you know, then it becomes even. You can even modulate the sound even more deeply. So the symbolic representations cannot be understood by anyone within the universe unless and until one is inspired by the vibration of supernatural aprakrita sound. You know? So we have to actually hear you know, from some transcendental source you know, the sound and then we can begin to understand you know, the sound, the knowledge in the Vedas, which descends in the chain of disciplic succession. Yeah. From the Lord to Brahma, from Brahma to Narada, 
for Nard, for Bias, and so on. And up here we have a picture of a bucket brigade. <laughs> this is how, of course, fires used to be put out. So they're passing on Parampara and trying not to spill anything. Yeah. It looks like this is a parallel bucket brigade. Yeah. No mundane scholar can translate or reveal the true import of the Vedic mantras, hymns. No mundane scholar can translate or reveal the import. It cannot be understood unless one is inspired or initiated by the authorized spiritual master. The original spiritual master is the Lord himself and the succession comes down through the sources of parampara as clearly stated in the fourth chapter of Bhagavad Gita. So unless one receives the transcendental knowledge from the authorized parampara, uh, one should be considered useless. Vipala mataha. Even though one may be greatly qualified in the mundane advancements of arts and science. Yeah. So we're useless unless this knowledge is coming down through parampara. Even though we have you know, very high qualifications in arts and sciences. So somebody may have very, very great technical ability of Sanskrit you know, in many ways, but it's all superficial. Do you know Sanskrit? I know a little. I have, I have a pra- I have a working knowledge. Yeah. Big, big Sanskrit is arrogant people. Do you know Sanskrit? You can say, I have a working knowledge. <laughs> you can ask them, do you have a working knowledge? They say, well, yes. I, I maintain my, my work very well. They're teaching other people to get a superficial knowledge. You know? But what's the work to be accomplished? To know Krishna. You know? So how much do you need to know Krishna? You know? Basically, two mantras. So Gurdjie Goswami is praying for the Lord by praying is praying from the Lord by dint of being inspired from within by the Lord so that he could rightly explain the facts and figures of creation as inquired by Maharaj Pariksit. A spiritual master is neither a theoretical speculator like the mundane scholar but is Shotriyam Brahmanistam. Yeah, not a theoretical speculator but he's, he's become he's fixed in Brahman by hearing. So to you, Brahmanistam, I guess Mukunda Upanishad, Mukunda, Mandaka or Mukunda Upanishad 1 2 12. Yeah, how's it go? So to you, Brahmanistam. So, of course, we're so fortunate by Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, by Srila Prabhupada, you know, we're being inspired uh, by the supernatural sound. And you can see it's inspiring Prabhupada. He's always Pachodaya, he's always coming up with new, fresh. You know things, perspective in his purports and stuff like that. Yeah. So that kind of finishes off our little presentation on his verse. Thank you very much, all very so far, but and the address of our webpage there, Jairam by US. So again, it's just one little glorification out of maybe we're saying maybe like, whew, you know, fifty, sixty different glorifications of of um, illuminations, orientations uh, of you know, by, by Sukadeva Goswami. Uh, before he tries to communicate the perspective and attitude towards uh, Mars Pariksit, before he tries to wake up Mars Pariksit's potent knowledge. So, any questions or comments? Any uh, like that? Anything? Where are we? Here? Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Did we drop off the chart here? Okay, I see my microphone moving. Yes, yes. <laughs> Hare Bowl, Hare Bowl. Okay. I can't hear anything from anybody. Um, I'm sorry, Maharaj. Forgive me. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was having some technical difficulties here. 
It's okay. You're on, oh, you're on, okay. Dr- you're on, on you drugs. Go. All right. I, did. I took everybody off. Okay. Uh, when, when it uh, says he appears to come from the mouth of Brahma, what is that specifically? No, because people think, you know, even when, it, when, we, when we go to the next section, which is this, this is introducing the discussion between Narada and Brahma, which is probably echoed all throughout many other Vedic literatures, you know. Even Narada Muni says it appears to him that Brahma is the source of all knowledge, intelligence, you know, the master of the universe. So the Vedic knowledge appears to come from, come, be originating from the mouth of Brahma. But, but it's not originating there. Prabhupada says it comes from his mouth, definitely, but it's not originating there. Are we unmuted? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, okay. I was going to going to ask a question as you were talking about reincarnation, which is always such a fascinating and um, kind of an in vogue uh, topic of discussion. I was going to ask you, but then I kind of thought of an answer and I wonder where you go with this. Um, you know, how, how do we convince the scientists of the fact that reincarnation exists and well two thoughts and answered my mind while I was waiting after the, the question came was one is that that we if we accept that our body is changing and that all of our cells are changing we literally do not have the same body we had seven years ago then we do in fact witness reincarnation within this very lifetime. We do, in fact, reincarnate. We don't have the same body we had when we were a baby. We don't have the same body we had when we were an adolescent. We don't have the same body we had when we were young men. That many, many times within this life, we see the soul transmigrate. That's one answer I thought of. And the other was, um, well, the, the scientists may say, but you can't prove it. You can't observe it. And then the answer to that would be, well, there's really not much in life we can prove anyway. Everything is kind of based on faith. Um, the scientists, that everyone takes a huge leap of faith that you can't prove intelligence exists. You can't prove anything exists outside of our own consciousness. I, uh, Descartes, I think, therefore, I am. So anyway, those are some thoughts that came in my mind. What, what would you say in terms of how do we prove this essential and fascinating concept of reincarnation um well it's such a big topic you know it's such a big thing of what is knowledge and everything else and Chaitanya Charitamrita Krishna Das Kavira says I offer my obeisance is to Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu by whose mercy even an ignorant child can cross over the ocean of ignorance and achieve the absolute truth which which ocean is full of the uh, the gigantic ocean-going crocodiles and sharks of philosophers like Kana, Kanada, Jaimini, Astavarka, you know. And so science and atomism is coming from Kanada. Yeah. And so these people are such gigantic, you know, philosophers, and they develop such incredible systems that do capture, like, so many things. Like Sigmund Freud has so many results, you know, in terms of curing people, you know, like that. But he was an atheist, you know. So I would say that that it's um, the Prabhupada's formula for dealing with the scientists, you know, and of course it can be, I think, universal, other thing too. So the first thing, one formula, maybe the other one, so one he gave was, first thing is nice reception. So Lord Chaitanya gave a nice reception to Prakashananda Saraswati. He sat down in a very humble place, you know. He gave a nice reception, you know, to Sarvabhoma. He listened to him without, without interrupting him. So, so many times that was Lord Chaitanya's first, you know, first position is, is giving the person all respect and, and, and glorification and, and appreciating his actual good qualities. Now, this is not, not actually, as was it, flattering, how to win friends and influence people. And his first quality is just the same. Amani <coughs> Amadena. Not being concerned about our qualities, but actually really looking at the good qualities that people have and stuff, you know. Okay, if that goes on, then the natural thing is, and they, they ask him, well, what's your opinion? What do you think? You know? And then, 
we can present things logically and stuff without deviating. There has to be that part in this formula where, where they actually ask us. You know? um, but before that, Prabhupada said, first thing, nice reception, nice prasad. And then uh, discussing, they're discussing things on this level of proof and, and all that kind of stuff. You know? And so in the age of Kali, without you know, uh, Vaishnava establishing a nice ambience, which kind of means Varnashram in many ways, and then without nice prasad, you know, it's impossible to go to the dhyan level of proof and discussion like that. So that's the kind of perspective that, that, that I have, you know, from, from preaching and stuff like that. Nice reception, nice prasad. And, and then, uh, when they ask you, then you can start, you know, uh, presenting things in, in an undeviating way. Not nasty, but undeviating about and the different logical arguments, like you're saying, and evidence, you know, and so on. But those have their counter-arguments and so on. And if somebody doesn't want to be convinced, okay, forget it. You know, or if somebody only only a little bit wants to be convinced, and it's going to be very hard, no matter what you do. You know, so it's also the person's own voluntary you know, desire. But the argument you gave, it's in the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, Shakespeare uses it. Solomon uses it. Who else? Uh, and Socrates uses it. You know? Most of the arguments that that we probably uses are, are right there with Socrates too, you know, and uh, I think Aristotle even, I mean not Aristotle, but the soul. But but they're basic arguments that and you find in so many classical people throughout traditions like that. You know. I, I like the point you made about Prashadam. <laughs> you know, to just to just convince someone that reincarnation exists there's nothing particularly spiritual about it in, in the sense that it's kind of a mechanical thing. If we accept that 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 there is that reincarnation is real, it's just it's a, really it's a type of of jnana, which if you don't go any further than that, it doesn't really do you any good anyway. Our point in preaching ultimately is to assist people in going back to Godhead and you know, all the gain in the world isn't going to get them back to Godhead. We have to change their hearts. Yeah. And giving the prashad will change the heart so that they can understand uh, reincarnation as as a step to uh, as a step to devotion to God, seeing God behind all of it. Because if we don't get them to that point of changing the heart, you know, all this it's just these are just mechanical things anyway. And that's yeah. really what we have to do is somehow change, change the heart. There's got to be a change in heart. Otherwise, it's all for naught. Hiranya Kasipu was talking all about reincarnation to his family members, no? I mean, Hiranya Kasipu and Kangsa and Jarasandha, they all believed in reincarnation. They were great scholars. They knew all this. Yeah. There was no change <laughs> in heart. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Wow. Demoniac, demoniac mentality, you know, to the, to the max. Yeah. We were talking yesterday about what an what incredible mystic yogi Aranyakashipu was. Yeah, I was, I was listening to your he, class yesterday. It was nice. Yeah, he did, he did all these, you know, to the point of, of his whole body was consumed. The, the blood, the marrow, everything was consumed, but yet it, he, he knew in that sense he was in his body, but it didn't do him any good, not a bit of good. Wow. Wow. <clears throat> so, yeah, and so it's a question, too, that if you look at these prayers, because, you know, the, the Bhagavatam starts off where the Bhagavad Gita finishes, and so I think Krishna's saying like Krishna, probably saying Krishna from the very beginning, many things. But usually the words are like Adhokshaja, uh, what else, you know, Bhag uh, Vasudev. You know, he, even Prabhupada's translating as Krishna, Krishna again and again. But in the beginning, the Bhagavatam is also starting off like slow, you know, and building up through different incarnations to find to come to Krishna. So really, we, we, we don't understand the Bhagavatam, we understand it through Lord Chaitanya. It's amazing, you know. Without Lord Chaitanya's personal, Papa says it becomes without the mercy of Lord Chaitanya, it becomes difficult to understand the Bhagavatam. It's in the introduction there, 
but I would say like impossible in most cases to understand without the mercy of Lord Chaitanya. And that's why we have Ch Chaitanya tried to meet us in all, it's in all the purports. You know, it's in the you know, teachings of Lord Chaitanya. You know, so without his mercy, Bhagavatam. But then you see Bhagavatam is so wonderful, my God. But it was, can't, can't understand it. You know? In, in Bhagavad Gita as well, we many of us read other editions of Bhagavad Gita until we came in contact with Prabhupada and read Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita. Then, with Prabhupada present, Nicham Bhagavata Seva, with Prabhupada present in the Bhagavad Gita, we were able to understand, and only by his blessings and only by his mercy. Yeah, some of the it was a Christopher Yeshua would and stuff. It's incredible. It's like. Again, the flowery language, but it's just like there's. It's, it's, it seems like he, not that he's trying to cover it, but he himself has almost no clue whatsoever, you know, what's actually going on, you know. But it makes it so flowery and stuff like that. So you read a little bit in this, oof, okay. But it gives you the impression that India has some great culture, but but what is it, you know? Yeah. So reincarnation, child prodigies, but again, you can, you can lead a horse to water, you know, but you, you can't make him drink. You know? Yeah, and I see that's the main thing is that, is that again, Prabhupada said every scientist you make a, a devotee is worth a thousand ordinary people, but then the experience is it takes about a thousand times as long to make a scientist into a devotee as it does an ordinary person. So if you want to get some result, go out and you know make you're preaching to ordinary people and. Okay, I, I made a thousand ordinary people into devotees, and after after five years, and okay, well, I made one scientist. Okay, <laughs> just, just what, well, what's your particular you know taste, your humor? <clears throat> I've I know big scientists, even though they have some inclination that this is actually the truth, they say, but but God, Doctor Singh, uh, this is is uh, I have so much knowledge, you know. For example, we talk about you know using cow dung as fuel. So one of these scientist guys we were dealing with was on the presidential committee for for energy like energy use, and so he knew how many kilocalories per <laughs> per something, you know, cow dung could produce and different kinds of cow dung, you know, and, and so it was like, you know, cow dung is a good fuel and stuff. But he had all this knowledge that he had to like, you know, adjust before he could really, you know, surrender, you know, to the, the most potent process, get up his jnana. So all that jnana becomes like a Big deal, you know, and this is a big deal. You got, you got it, and it can be good or bad, but you just got to deal with it, and you got to go through and study and reread and get all that knowledge in order. Otherwise, you know, you can't surrender fully. And when you do surrender, Papa says, slow to come, slow to go. So when these guys finally surrender, forget it. You can have, you know, drop atomic bombs in their heads and not going to give up, deviate, you know, because they have such, you know, deep, deep, thorough the knowledge of the culture and the philosophy in an intellectual sense. All right. It, it looked like um, when Lord Chaitanya and also Prabhupada, how they would uh, talk to those atheists is that they more or less charmed them with their personality. Uh, personality and, and, efful and bodily effulgence. <laughs> that worked a bit too. Yeah. But and I mean... It, the Lord body, right? Prabhupada says, he says, he says a good smile and bodily effulgence. He says he, the Lord, he has, he has these things and he should use them in his preaching. His smile and his effulgence. Yeah. Yeah. Promoting on the Saraswati, Papa said, this is the way to preach. Yeah, for a sannyasi. I mean, like that. You, know, okay. you, you get some uh, f you know, you know, foot in the door, he says some local people are, you know, host you or something, people you know. Then he says you try and contact the leading people, the sannyasi mode of preaching. And, uh, and then if, they, if you can convert them, you know, then everybody else will follow like that and so on. You know. But he says he, he didn't argue with Prakashan on the Saraswati. He said all these swamis and, every, swamis and everything else already are, are irritated with us. So if we talk to them, talk to them impolitely, they'll simply become more angry at us. He, he says, uh Chaitanya turn Prabodhananda Saraswati's mind with sweet words. You know, just what you're saying like that, you know? Charming. You, know, you see that, you know, just the word charming, yoga maya, you know, like that. You know. But 
But it's uh, a little past 12 here, I guess. So we should head off to our uh, our Gayatri Sanya, Sanya and everything else like that. And we're very glad to be back from all of our travels here and be able to join your Sangha again. Here in the, uh, the second canto. I guess it's pretty much just coming to the end. And next we're going to hear the uh, actual conversation between Brahma and Narada. Mm. Okay, well, thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. All nice glories to have you back. Nice to have yeah. you back in our Sangha. Yeah, hopefully we get we get, get back the spiritual world to say that too. You know, <laughs> well, that'll be so, great. So bad you made it. So glad you made it. Yeah. We're coming to the spiritual now. world. Yeah. This is the spiritual world in our sangha. Jai, all glory to Shri Prabhupada. Hare Jai, Hare Bhav.